college students are pressured more and more to let go of reality and accept the transgender narrative and even they're even pressured to use transgender pronouns. Uh, if you were in medical school today, how would you respond to that pressure? That's a good, que <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I mean, I would hope that I would cling to uh, reality, real, uh, reality and sound reason, words matter. Biology is reality, not bigotry. Um, we're at a point now in which we know, we have documented 6,500, at least 6,500 genetic differences between men and women. Men and, men and women cannot be treated the same in medicine. They, uh, because of these genetic differences, women are more prone to autoimmune diseases, for example, than men are. We must approach our patients in accordance with uh, their biology, not in accordance with their perceptions, which are delusional. So the issue of what Cotello is doing here is she's presenting general clustering, differences and averages, as if that is a strict sexual dimorphism. It isn't. Women are more prone to autoimmune diseases, yet men still get them as well. It should be noted that her argument here is the same sort of argument used by white supremacists to argue that race is a strict biological category. Due to the geographical partition up to the invention of air travel, different populations of people developed slightly varying immunities to different diseases. For example, the bubonic plague which swept through Europe resulted in the remaining Europeans having greater immunity to similar diseases. On the other hand, places with high levels of malaria carrying mosquitoes often have increased rates of sickle cell anemia since the blood cells of such people are less hospitable to the parasite. Races come along and point to this, claiming to be evidence of clear racial division, when really it's just evidence of general clustering. When it comes to male and female, the truth is the lines are a lot more blurred than Cretello is letting on. For a start, 2% of all live births are medically recognized as intersex. That means at least one of their main sexual characteristics, chromosomes, hormones, gametes, external genitalia, and internal reproductive organs, is out of line with the sex the other characteristics are typically associated with. However, the truth is this. Every human being on this planet has some variation when it comes to these traits. Almost all cis men have some level of estrogen. Almost all cis women have some level of testosterone. And when we begin to acknowledge that, we begin to realize that sex is a hell of a lot more complicated than what we're taught in school. This is how we end up with people that have predominantly XY karyotype, chromosomes, giving birth to multiple perfectly healthy children. Because sex as a category is something we as a species have invented. Sex evolved and is still evolving, and our understanding works well as a general rule. The problems start to emerge when we take a general rule to be an absolute, a state we will force people to adhere to, even though their very existence is evidence that the rule is not all-encompassing. At that point, Critella has taken sex as a general description of what we see, and turned it into a standard to force everyone to adhere to. There is child mutilation going on in the West to the degree that people like Critella and the ACP talk about but it is not of young trans people who socially transition or receive fully reversible puberty blockers to delay medical transition until they can give informed consent. It is a mutilation of the medically recognized intersex people mentioned earlier. Though the vast majority are perfectly healthy, the practice for decades has been that of doctors pressuring parents into seeking surgical intervention, sometimes starting mere months after the child has been born, and continuing into the child's teenage years. At no point is the child's well-being even considered. Everything is done for purely cosmetic purposes, because people have been sold a strictly dimorphic notion of sex. They're told that their child will never be accepted unless they seek surgery immediately. Not once do they consider the cycle of shame that creates. A common story for people with androgen insensitivity syndrome, people with internal testes who are incapable of utilizing the testosterone produced, is that they're told they have ovarian cancer when they're in their teenage years. 
Under this lie, they are operated on, never being told that their intersex and Z internal testes hold no real risk. Again, 2% of all live births are medically intersex, and that number might be higher if it weren't for the fact that doctors very often sterilize intersex children with the ability to reproduce. Only recently has the story begun to shift as self-led intersex advocacy groups have risen up to challenge the practice. Now here's where trans people enter the equation. Gender is a product of the mind and the mind is a product of the physical brain. On this basis, I would argue it fair to consider the brain, specifically the part responsible for gender identity, a sexual characteristic. Therefore, I would argue trans people, as with medically recognized intersex people, are the exception to the general rule. Fact is, our understanding of biology is growing as more information becomes available to us. The model you are forwarding not only fails to account for everything we observe, it forwards actions demonstrated to be incredibly unethical. Not just for trans people, but medically recognized intersex people and even our species as a whole. Doctors need to be prepared to, at times, challenge their base assumptions on general rules. Because sometimes when doctors assume something. That can be fatal for the patient. And that's true of cis patients as well as trans patients. Fact is, as noted earlier, how a trans person is treated by their doctors is none of your damn business. We have something known as confidentiality. Maybe you heard of it when you were studying how to let blood. Um, so I would hope I'd be able to respond uh, in that fashion, uh, but it would be very difficult because just as um, we are seeing this tyrannical enforcement of Newspeak uh, on our college campuses, it is that way within the highest levels of, of medicine. I'm going to need to see some actual evidence of that claim, not simply assertions, because all we currently have is you and the rest of the American College of Pediatricians rejecting the scientific consensus and being held accountable for their actions. Actions which stand in clear violation of basic ethics. That's not tyranny, that's accountability. Um, again, at, at, at our office at the American College of Pediatricians, I receive emails and phone calls even from physicians and therapists, uh, psychologists on the left, uh, who are clearly against us because we're, we're pro-life, and, and you know, again, they're on the left, and um, they're even LGB affirming, but they will thank me for speaking out because we wish we could, but we can't. We'll lose our jobs. Um, we'll get death threats. I receive emails from um, concerned parents throughout the nation um, asking me to review health curricula and it has now become transphobic to teach middle, middle school students that um, women have ovaries and men have testes. That's transphobic. Now I tried to find the story but couldn't and honestly I don't find it all that surprising. I doubt trans people are going to be making much of a fuss over the statement that men have testes and women have ovaries in middle school. We've got a lot more pressing matters going on. Sure, it'd be nice for science teachers to clarify that this is a general rule and that there are exceptions, not just for the sake of trans people, but intersex people as well. But nobody goes to middle school expecting a comprehensive and nuanced understanding of the topics. That's why biologists don't get mad when they see charts like these being used for evolution. This isn't evolution. This is. The way evolution is presented in school makes it appear like a singular line of life, seemingly heading towards a purpose with less advanced life forms appearing less human-like. As for the other stuff you mentioned, you advocated for the torture of children in the last video I responded to, something I explained with evidence as I responded. I can very well understand people being angry at you and those who share your perspective on trans people. You've chosen to 
threaten people's children. Anger is the human response to that. The ACP's goal is to eradicate all LGBT plus people to either kill us, drive us to take our own lives, or harm us to such a degree that we're forced back into the closet, where we'll live a faint echo of the person we are. Let's just be absolutely clear of what your goals are. You can't change us, so eradication is your only option. I've not received any death threats. I, I have been accused of being the leader of the skinheads of pediatricians um, and a lot of other things that you know we wouldn't repeat in polite company. Oh, my, one of my, one of my greatest uh, fans goes by Slowly Boiled Frog has decided that um, I'm not, uh, I'm not even licensed to be a doctor. And he, he or she writes it in such a way to imply that, you know, I'm, I'm some sort of charlatan or maybe I did something illegal. So for the record, yes, I still am licensed. I have chosen not to do clinical practice because I believe advocacy is, uh, a, requires a full-time commitment. <laughs> So on one hand, Critello asserts very bluntly that she is still licensed, whilst on the other claiming that she has chosen to focus on advocacy. And it's very possible to do both. Indeed, any doctor taking part in political advocacy relating to medicine should renew their license as new information becomes available, advances are made, and it's vital that people out there influencing the public be kept up to date on that. Fact is, Critella's lying. And she knows it. I know it. The aforementioned slowly bored frog knows it. Why? Well, because we've all seen the current status of her medical license. It expired on the 30th of November 2015. This interview was carried out in November of 2017. So why is Critella stating such blatant lies? Well, her entire method of convincing people centers around her presentation as a leading pediatrician. Nothing she has said so far on the topic has been factually sound. She's never published an article defending her position in a peer-reviewed fashion. She's got no standing when it comes to the science, so she has to resort to a self-imposed argument from authority. Therefore, any challenge to that authority has to be dismissed outright. If people realise that Critella rejects the science to the point that she refuses to engage with either the peer-reviewed or the medical licensing systems, perhaps a few of them would begin to view her assertions with more scrutiny. And that's a potential death sentence for her career. So I'll see you next time to see just how bad Critella's understanding of gender and sex can really get. Given, of course, with the always original, attack helicopter arguments. Yay! As always, please check out our other videos. You can also support Essence of Thought via Patreon, and in doing so, help us become ad free. We'd just like to say a big thank you to everyone who's already given to the channel, giving a special thanks to the following people Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Mook Gay, Steve Corbin, Caitlin Smart, Wellington Marcus, Atlas5, and Sash Daniels. And for myself and Adita, take care now.